Hello and welcome. And my name is Joe Saramelli, and I oversee Grand Rounds for the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Uh, thank you for joining uh, today's Grand Rounds presentation uh, for our department. Uh, a couple of comments about our Grand Rounds series. Um, there's a group of us that work on Grand Rounds each week, which includes uh, Samhar Braha and Mike Walker. Uh, we do record and archive all of our Grand Rounds presentations. So today's presentation will be recorded and archived and should be available uh, by the beginning of next week to watch on our department website. Uh, funding for our Grand Round series is through the Ripley Fund and the Garvey Institute for Brain Health Solutions. Uh, towards the end of the presentation, I'll put a link in the chat that has a four or five question brief evaluation that's helpful for me in planning Grand Rounds and uh, in communicating with speakers. Uh, something different about today's presentation, I'll, I'll mention, uh, Dr. Priggerson and I were, were talking, uh, you can write questions and comments all during the presentation. You don't have to wait until the end. Feel free to write those during the presentation because uh, Dr. Priggerson will respond, sort of determine what to present next based on comments and questions that come in. So write as, as something comes to your mind, you can comment and write a question. Uh, now I'll get to... Uh, on to today's uh, presenter. Today, uh, today's Grand Rounds presentation is by Dr. Holly Priggerson, uh, who is the Irving Sherwood Wright Professor of Geriatrics at Weill Cornell Medicine and uh, co-director of the Cornell Center uh, for Research on End-of-Life Care. Uh, now, Dr. Priggerson's work has, has really spanned uh, disciplines. Grief uh, due to loss is, is seen by clinicians really in many fields, and in some fields in, in large numbers of individuals. But a smaller group of people uh, can develop a, a constellation of symptoms and impairment uh, called prolonged grief disorder, uh, which is what we'll hear about today. Uh, now, Dr. Priggerson has served as PI on numerous uh, NIH investigations, including studies that have justified inclusion of prolonged grief disorder in ICD-11 and DSM-5 and which have examined psychosocial influences on and outcomes of end-of-life care. Uh, relatedly, Dr. Priggerson uh, also conducts studies of racial ethnic disparities in end-of-life care, studies on religiousness and spirituality, and have examined uh, online tools to detect risk of suicidal ideation in caregivers uh, of patients with end-stage disease. Um, now, for this work, Dr. Priggerson has, re has received several awards, including Harvard Medical School's Clifford Barger Excellence and Mentoring Award, the National Cancer Institute's R35 uh, uh, Outstanding Investigator Award, which has been renewed, and the 2018 American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine Excellence in Scientific Research Award. Now, with that, I'll, I'll stop here, uh, turn it over to Dr. Priggerson, and again, I encourage you to write questions, comments as the presentation uh, goes on. Thank you. Okay. Uh Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to be here uh, with you um, and, and talk about uh, the work that we've done on prolonged grief disorder. As Joe said, I welcome uh, interruptions and uh, try to make it as interactive as possible. I will be presenting a lot of data. I know that a lot of times psychiatrists uh, get tired of seeing all the numbers and, and the data and want more clinical uh, the focus on uh, clinical implications of the work. So I'll try to focus on, I'll do my best. I'm not a clinician, uh, I'm a clinical researcher, but I do welcome uh, questions and uh, challenges to what, we, what we're proposing and ways to address it clinically. Okay, so without further ado, let me share my screen. And oh, let's see. Um, Okay. So uh, I'll be talking today about several things, starting with uh, a presentation about how prolonged grief disorder got into the DSM-5 text revision. I'll provide a very brief backstory uh, about what happened. I'll present uh, evidence that supported the DSM's decision and also the ICD's decision to include a prolonged grief disorder in the latest version, the criteria themselves. And then I'll try to address a lot of uh, um, you know, I, what I call uh, cognitive uh, 
distortions about what what's really going on with prolonged grief disorder and how it's distinguishable from other psychiatric uh, illnesses secondary to bereavement, but also from normal grief itself. I'll then present our microsociological theory of adjustment to loss. We argue that the focus has been too much on psychological symptoms and criteria, and that bereavement's largely a social uh, the uh, phenomenon, event, uh, the loss of someone else, and that the need to address those uh, social deprivations is an important part of uh, a readjustment in the wake of someone's uh, death. I'll then be using that theory to discuss some uh, applications uh, regarding a lot of web-based web applications and interventions that we're working on developing. Then I'll be presenting uh, some uh, uh, preliminary evidence in support of a recently funded multi-site R01 we call Empower um, and our, uh, an RCT for naltrexone for the treatment of grief specifically. All right, so to provide a little bit of the backstory, I was a sociologist. I guess I say was because I don't think most sociologists would think I'm a sociologist anymore. But I was trained as a sociologist at, at Stanford. And um, my fiance at the time, I was a postdoc at, at Yale in psychiatric epidemiology. And my husband was, uh, husband to be at the time was at Pittsburgh. And they did, we got married and they didn't know where to put me. So they put me in the late life mood disorders with Chip Reynolds and, and Ellen Frank. And so with the, every week we uh, look at uh, IPT and nortriptyline and look at whether the Hamilton depression scores or the um, generalized anxiety symptoms were declining in response to um, monotherapy or combined treatment. And as someone who was not indoctrinated and socialized in psychiatry, I, I was just looking at the data and I noticed that the TRIG scores, the Texas Revised Inventory of Grief Scores weren't budging. Their depressive symptoms were going down, their anxiety related symptoms were going down. Chip was delighted, the group was happy. And I said, but but their TRIG scores aren't, aren't moving anywhere. And the, the response that I got was, well, why does that matter? Grief, uh, grief is the normal reaction when you lose someone you love. And, you know, we don't want to pathologize that as long as we're treating the symptoms of anxiety and depression, we're doing what we set out to do and, um, and, and all should be fine and, and don't worry about the symptoms of grief. But I did. And I didn't, I said, how do you know that those symptoms alone are not uh, over and above the symptoms of depression and anxiety aren't associated with pathological outcomes. And Chip, as a good mentor, uh, he, as the good mentor he is, uh, we're still very uh, close. He's like, good for you. Why don't you study that? Why don't you, you know, use our data and, you know, knock yourself out? The basic hypothesis that the psychiatrist in the room, Dan Bicey, a whole bunch of the, the group at, in the late life mood disorders clinic had was that all those symptoms of grief, bereavement related distress for these late life, wit they were mostly widows, mostly white widows, uh, that they would all load on a single factor. So, you know, I set out to try to understand what was going on with these grief symptoms and why they were not responding to things that were working for the symptoms of anxiety and depression. So you might wanna put a pin in that idea that those symptoms were not responding to other psychiatric interventions that were working in the context of bere bereavement related depression. So the first question was, are these symptoms distinct from those of bereavement related depression and anxiety? Are they uh, consistent, internally consistent and also reliable uh, over time? And are most importantly, uh, we put an emphasis on validity, in, in particular incremental valid validity that is the prediction of future bad outcomes over and above competing risks, such as depression or PTSD or generalized anxiety disorder or panic. So the first question related to it's the distinctiveness of these symptoms of grief. 
do symptoms of prolonged grief disorder form a separate unidimensional, internally consistent symptom cluster apart from a symptom cluster that defined bereavement-related depression and anxiety? And then if, if yes, how much would those symptoms overlap with uh, existing uh, criteria, uh, diagnoses such as major depression, generalized anxiety, and PTSD? So this is the was the first the first finding that said, okay, these symptoms are different. And what what the what these results, you know, we've published this, the first result was in American Journal of Psychiatry in 95, and and then our inventory of complicated grief uh, was also published that year that further confirmed this distinctiveness. But basically, in in a principal components analysis, you're looking for simple structure where the things that load on one one construct uh, don't load highly on these other constructs, uh, or conversely, the things that load highly on a certain uh, one, for example, symptoms of depression or feeling blue loaded high on a depress depression factor, symptoms of anxiety um, it were inversely associated with the depression factor and loaded separately on an anxiety factor, the symptoms of grief, the yearning for the person who died, intrusive thoughts about that person, symptoms of identification with that person, feeling drawn to reminders of that person, feeling their presence, a sense of deep connection to a, a particular person were different than feeling sad and feeling anxious about that. So that's been replicated for many, many years with many uh, independent investigators all over the world and cross-culturally, that these symptoms form distinct symptom clusters. We wanted to know whether they were reliable. And, and in terms of re reliability over time, test read test reliability is a challenge because with bereavement, there is this um, decay, if you will, over, over time from the index event. I, I know I'm talking like an epidemiologist, but there's uh, the death, and then over time, would the symptom, mean symptom scores at one point be highly correlated with those symptom scores at two, six, three weeks and months later? And they were over a six-week test retest, highly rel reliable over time. They were extremely internally consistent, as I'll show you in the next few slides. And importantly, they, they didn't have high degrees of overlap. Uh, with these currently existing psychiatric disorders. So for example, the fee coefficient between meeting criteria for a prolonged grief disorder and major depressive disorder was 0.36. In this particular sample, it was 0.31 for PTSD and 0.17 for generalized anxiety disorder. When we take the people who met criteria for those other disorders, competing diagnoses, depression, PTSD, generalized anxiety disorder, 44% uh, also had comorbid PGD. So we're not saying that they don't, these symptoms don't co-occur with these other disorders, but that they are distinctive. The percentage that would, so those are, those are people that are at risk of being diagnosed with anxiety or depression. And as I started, the problem with that is they'd be treated with treatments that we, how I got into this is those, the, the symptoms aren't responsive to tricyclic antidepressants and interpersonal psychotherapy as are symptoms of de bereavement related depression and anxiety. Moreover, you're, there's a group that would be missed. So about a third of the cases of PGD were exclusive and didn't co-occur with uh, major depression, PTSD, or generalized. So those are those are people who have a, what we will show is a diagnosable sin disorder who are not, not recognized as needing or benefiting from treatment. So initially, when I found that first factor, we, we analyzed, we had a scale. This was still in Pittsburgh with Chip Reynolds Group. And what we found was in our inventory of complicated grief, we used uh, a, a package developed at Carnegie Mellon uh, called uh, Tetrad at the time, and it had a procedure that I loved. I just love the name of the procedure. It was called Purify. So we wanted to purify this scale of the uh, 
impurities of depression related symptomatology and anxiety. And as you can see, these symptoms loaded really highly into the high internal consistency, defining a coherent syndrome on this grief factor. When we did a principal components analysis, a scree plot, you can see it's a little big, but it's it's it was really one thing, one dimensional grief thing that was pure in that it, it wasn't, we had uh, removed the symptoms of bereavement related depression and anxiety. We recently for the DSM-5 TR tested that in five different samples. I, I We published the three of these, these analyses in World Psychiatry in 2021. And they showed the same thing, basically that there's a high degree of uh, internally consistent, one component stands out across a sample in Utrecht and at Oxford, the Oxford uh, brief study. So it really, in terms of reliability, internal consistency, it was really one syndrome. It really was co a coherent set of symptoms. The bigger question, aside from co coherence, because coherence doesn't matter if it's not a concern to anyone. So we wanted to know what th this analysis here is, is an example where we had um, we basically wanted to do to test incremental validity. And, and what I mean by that is we took out the people who had met criteria for major depressive disorder, uh, PTSD and, and generalized anxiety so that we could say, oh, excluding those sort of confounding factors, what's the likelihood that bad outcomes would be solely in the future would be solely attributed to meeting the criteria for a PGD diagnosis in a six to in the six to 12 months post loss predicting a 12 to 24 months outcome. So you can see in, in this table, there was a, almost an 8.5 times relative risk of, of meeting criteria in the future for depression, PTSD and GAD in those who had met criteria at six to 12 months. So it, in, in that sense, it's, it's, it seems to be a gateway to other uh, disorders in the future. It was, and we've shown this in other uh, samples, it's the strongest predictor of, psychiatric predictor of suicidal ideation in bereaved people who are at extremely elevated risk, especially suicide bereavement or accidental overdose bereavements. So here you can see those who met criteria six to 12 months, uh, This these were the former criteria, which are largely similar to the current ones, but I'll show, I'll update it in the next slide. But you can see 50, almost 60% met, had suicidal ideation in the PGD positive group compared to 10% uh, in the non-PGD positive group. 71% were functionally disabled, 83% had poor quality of life. So it was over and above, excluded, excluding these competing diagnoses, it was predicting a lot of uh, distress and, and impairment at follow-up. In the, in the recent validation of the current criteria in DSMTR, we tested across you know, five different databases. Here we show the, the results from three, three of these studies. And I, I, don't, I won't go through all, all the specific analyses here. Bottom line, we did the Yale study, we did the Utrecht study, we did the Oxford study, we did concurrent, looking at whether it was a, a sig meeting criteria at 12 months. So uh, we moved, the criteria were moved to a 12 months post-loss di diagnosis. Um, and that's concurrently predicted PTSD, major depression, GAD, suicidal ideation in the Yale study, it's all sorts of uh, physical and social and role functioning and general health impairment pain. In the Utrecht sample, it predicted uh, PTSD and suicidality and depression and same in the Oxford sample and, in, and also uh, work disability and social disability. It also predicted these outcomes at follow-up a year later uh, significantly. So, so that's when we say, does it have predictive validity? I think the data have really been pretty clear that we're not pathologizing grief. Th these symptoms are associated with significant distress and functional impairment and morbidity. 
we actually are, are proposing a study to look at mortality, which is also associated with, with high levels of grief, intense grief, such as dying of a broken heart and Sakasubo syndrome. But I'll get to that later if there's time. In this analysis, what we wanted to do was to compare this notion of acute grief, delayed grief, persistent, and some combination, which is what we ultimately went with. So what, what these data show is that concurrently, when you look at people who are high in the symptoms of these particular symptoms of grief in the first six months post-loss, does that predict at a year to two years post-loss these same outcomes that we were talking about, major depression, PTSD, suicidal ideation, functional impairment, poor quality of life. Does the acute grief predict those bad outcomes in the future? And the answer is no. So those first six, that told us it's, it's too soon in the first six months to apply these criteria and reliably show who's going to be stuck and distressed and disabled in an enduring way. But then we ask a question that a lot of people have doubted. And uh, not only in, in bereavement, but in, in the PTSD and, and trauma literature, uh, for example, with combat, is there such a thing as a delayed onset of, of prolonged grief disorder? So here what we did was we, we took people who were not high in the first on these symptoms in the first six months, but were high at this. This is for a six month post loss assessment. Would that delay that they weren't high, but then they come high on those symptoms. It wasn't that many of them, only 3.5% of that, that sample. It was very significantly associated with suicidal ideation and poor quality of life. And people who were high on those very symptoms from the beginning until six months post-loss. So persistently high rather than a delayed onset and then high. And so those people were clearly more distressed and impaired in the future. So what we did was we we took, uh, this, these data were from the our PLAS Medicine 2009 sample. But what, what those data showed was that the 11.6%, which was higher because it was six months post-loss and there was some resolution by 12 months post-loss. But in those people, if it didn't matter how they got to being high on those symptoms at six months, whether it was a delay or persistent, if they were high on those symptoms, either way, at six months, it was hugely predictive of all these bad outcomes a year to two years later. So th those were, in a nutshell, some of the most compelling uh, evidence that uh, the DSM-5 committee were shown to validate and, and demonstrate there was a need for a new disorder. So in 2021, um, there was a press release that PGD was, was going to be a new disorder. Uh, before my talk today, we were talking about the role of COVID in, in all this. And if the press release definitely highlighted COVID making death and grief uh, more salient in everyone's mind. So there was this final recognition that uh, uh, PGD deserved a place in, in the diagnostic nomenclature, in the, in the psychiatric Bible that people love, or, love to hate, uh, the DSM. So what is, how do you define it? Prolonged grief disorder is a chronic, intense, distressing reaction to loss distinct from bere bereavement related depression and anxiety. Unlike normal grief, people with PGD feel stuck they feel it's like Groundhog Day. Every day is like they just feel they can't get out of this loop of incessant wanting and missing and, and a sense of being frustrated, uh, craving something they can't have, which is this their loved one who was security and uh, providing uh, made them feel loved, appreciated, understood. That main person in Yiddish, the word is Bashar. That's so, it can be the, oftentimes it's a soulmate's die the, that these people feel so forlorn and adrift after that person's gone, they're stuck in this chronic state of missing them, yearning them, wanting them back, feeling an, numb and emotionally detached from people they used to feel close to, 
having an identity disturbance, no longer knowing where you fit in, what you're lacking meaning and purpose in your life, and really protesting the reality that this real a sense of shock and disbelief that this this really didn't happen, and almost hoping and willing that it, it's a bad dream and that it will go away. The prevalence is really quite low. Uh, the, in international studies, there's a German sample. Uh, the prevalence in, in the population was that was sampled, a, a, a population-based study was 1%. Among those who were bereaved, it was less than 3%. Um, a lot of studies show, I think a 4% in community-based bereaved samples seems about uh, the most accurate rate prevalence rate for the disorder. Technically, the definition, how to diagnose it, it has to be a death of someone close 12 months that occurred 12 months prior. Nearly every day in the last month or to a clinically significant degree, they have to feel this intense sense of missing and yearning and pining and longing for that person and a preoccupation with thoughts of this person. They have to meet three of the following eight uh, criteria. C criteria, uh, that there's an identity disruption, that they no longer uh, are sure of who they are, where they fit in, and uh, who uh, their role in life. There's a sense of shock and disbelief, an avoidance, but not in the PTSD sense of avoiding things that are frightening to them. Here, it's avoiding the reality this, that this person's not coming back anymore, that this truly happened. Avoiding, avoiding things that remind them that this person is really gone and not coming back. That, that's the type of avoidance in, in PGD, which is distinct from a fear-based avoidance in PTSD. There's a sense of emotional pang and Anger sometimes. Anger seems to be the most common in deaths that were from violence, uh, not from natural causes. So especially in later life, uh, the anger element of it is, and it compared to traumatic deaths that can often be comorbid with PTSD, the anger is, is muted in uh, PGD for older people who die from natural causes. There's a difficulty in feeling in reintegrating into life and feeling that, that there's a sense of purpose and meaning and feeling acutely uh, detached from others and alone. So it's that th th those are social symptoms. You feel that you're not part of the group, that, that there's a sense of being, uh, of ano, as Durkheim described, uh, anomie, the sense of alienation. And those symptoms are required to be part uh, associated with significant impairment in function. So by definition, they have to be uh, dysfunctional, uh, dis disabling symptoms of grief. So now I'd like to uh, turn to some common mis misconceptions. I'd like to correct co some cognitive distortions about uh, some things that I've seen in the press about prolonged grief disorder that I, I'd like to, to address here. And um, uh, I, I understand where some of these, uh, the naysayers have come from. Uh, when the New York Times has an article that leads with uh, how long should it take to grieve, psychiatry has come up with an answer that's asking for a bereaved person who's uh, who feels like psychiatry is in the uh, uh, the is is very driven by big pharma or is uh, stigmatizing and labeling people as sick who are normal and can get on with life themselves. I'd like to address, it's understandable that there was a negative reaction to it's feeling like psychiatry is telling you how long you can love somebody and how long you should grieve their loss. That's not what we're doing, and I'd like to address some of the the main the main misconceptions. So one of the main misconceptions is that if if you have a diagnosis for prolonged grief disorder, your family will stick and society at large will stigmatize you and withdraw support from you and label you as sick and try to push unwanted treatment. So I've I've been given uh, I've been told that those are concerns of why this disorder is is a problem. 
we actually, in the Yale Bereavement Study, uh, thanks to Michael First, who had uh, anticipated some of these concerns, we asked people who had, did and didn't meet criteria for prolonged grief disorder uh, if they thought that their family would be less understanding of their distress if they met criteria for a, a diagnosis of uh, prolonged grief disorder. And two, only 2% 2 said they would be less understanding. 98% said that they'd be more understanding. 90% thought that uh, their family and friends would, would understand them and blame them less. Over 96% said that they would be relieved to know that they weren't going crazy. 96% responded that they would be relieved to know that they had a recognizable uh, problem. And 100% of those who met criteria, about 96%, I think, of those who, in the full sample, said that they would be interested in treatment. So they are coming to me, they, people you know, come to me for treatment, even though I'm not a, a psychiatrist, because they've tried everything. And as I started at this talk, nothing's, nothing appeared to work. And I'll be getting to some novel treatments that do appear to be working, but that was the issue, is they're being treated for things that, for disorders that they don't have, for treatments that don't work for the symptoms that they do have. The other uh, criticism leveled at the inclusion in DSM-5 was that uh, the criteria are, are too easy to meet. Everyone grieves over the loss of someone they love, and it pathologizes normal grief. Well, the criteria I've been told uh, for decades are extremely difficult to meet. That's why 4% of the German sample uh, met criteria with only 1% of the full sample meeting criteria. We find a false positive rate compared to a, a diagnosis from a psychiatrist as 1.4%. The diagnostic criteria require severe distress and impairment as baked into the formulation. And they predict, as I've shown, suicidality, depression, bodily pain, worse general health, vitality, social and role function, and even heart attacks and incident, incident case of cancer. So, I don't think we are pathologizing normal grief. We're identifying a very extreme reaction that poses a significant risk to people's health in the future. To say that the evidence base is thin, uh, so uh, Alan Francis and colleagues have said that if this was thrown into the DSM uh, willy nilly without substantial. Um, uh, scientific evaluation of the evidence that put forth. At, as of last August, there were over 600 peer-reviewed articles on the, that validated the criteria with 10 systematic reviews in the past five years. There's been ample evidence. That's what the DSM committee had been evaluating, including among uh, the three, among other Men, those 600 were the studies that we did in five international uh, samples. The final point is that people don't like being told that there's um, a recognizable pattern of adjusting to loss, that there, there are, to say that there are stages of grief and that time heals uh, is, is uh, I, th I believe it's largely a narcissistic insult that people don't like to be put into boxes and told that someone else knows what they're feeling, how long they're going to feel it, and that um, th it's not linear. There's a, a, a reluctance to say that there are these, these designated patterns. The other uh, notion out there is that time heals all wounds. And so we, we've tested some of these ideas. Now, one of our um, most controversial publications to date was what I was expecting to be the least controversial publication to date. We were testing Kubler-Ross's stage theory of grief, the DABDA, the disbelief, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance model. And we took out the people who met criteria for prolonged grief because we just wanted to describe reactions over time. And that got people in, People went crazy, uh, not saying that this is uh, too simplistic, it's over generalized. No matter what anyone said before I present the data that examined this, 
I think there are two undeniable truths in the stage theory of grief. The first is that whenever someone gets horrible news, news that they they think is is just shocking and and um, awful, the first reaction is is disbelief. It's a deer in the headlights response. Like this can't a diagnosis of cancer, for example. This this can't be happening. This a sense of unreality that this is this this is too too bad to be true. Likewise, there's this notion of uh, that that people adjust to things over time. So no matter what, even awful, awful situations over time, uh, like a, a frog in boiling water, people adjust and, and accommodate to even the worst of situations by and large. The vast majority of people adjust to, to most situations. Now, I was told by a smart research assistant that this model doesn't apply to the bereavement at, um, because especially that picture of a, a frog in boiling water, the bereaved people go on and uh, in their, in their circumstances, they're not going to die because of their adjustment, like a, a patient who's dying of cancer uh, finally accepts and is resigned to, to what's happening. Uh, so for, for bereavement, we, we think that the image should be more uh, back in the saddle and a reintegration. We also take issue with the term acceptance because I, we don't think that people actually accept, accept seems like too high a bar, but that they feel resigned and reintegrated into the new normal that is life in the wake of this, this person's death. So in 2007, we used the Yale Bereavement Study data to test the stage theory of grief. So we, we had a sample of largely late life widows and we asked them, uh, you know, what each of those symptoms of grief over, and we assess them over time. And what we found in the first uh, analysis was that by and large, most people, even initially in the, in the first few months post-loss, accept that the person's dying and that increases over time. The predominant negative grief indicator was yearning for the person, not depression. That was down here. Uh, and there was some disbelief, as I mentioned, anger really isn't that common, um, especially in, in older, in later life uh, bereavement from na natural causes. But my husband's a statistician and he looks at this and he's like, I see something different in this. Let me recalibrate it so that they're all on the same. It's answering a different question of the data. So here, what he did was he said, let's Let's determine using these same data when each of those uh, adabda, those five stages or states of grief, peak when each one is maximally expressed post loss, removing the people who are stuck. And what we found was that it was exactly the sequence that was proposed by DABDA disbelief, uh, uh, anger, acceptance. Uh, bar bargaining is is more for pre-loss because you can't bargain after someone's died. Uh, depression, anger, and then ultimately there's acceptance. So the likelihood that by chance each would peak in that exact sequence was 0 0.008, lending some credence to uh, the stage theory of grief. But importantly, what we had done in that analysis was remove the people who would meet criteria for PGD. And what in this analysis, what, what we show is a lot of concern has been raised that you're um, diagnosing people who, if just given enough time, time will heal all wounds and they'll, they'll look like everyone else, just you know, give it time. And what we did in this analysis, this was using, this is an old and crude, I apologize for how ugly it is, but what we're looking at is whether people who met criteria at six months post-loss at that time for uh, prolonged grief disorder, what their mean grief symptom scores would look like over the course of this study observation for about, you know, over three years. And what we find is that the red, the people who met criteria were high initially, and they remained high throughout, whereas the people uh, who didn't were high, higher initially and, and largely uh, it, it does resolve over time. So there were these two distinct groups and, and the, 
the red line didn't merge into the blue line to form a purple line, there were clearly two distinguishable groups, one that's prolonged grief and one and one that's the more normal natural uh, grief. So recently, I wanted newer data to, to examine this issue. And so I asked a Taiwanese uh, uh, colleague to examine the same issue in her Taiwanese data. And you can see that there, you know, there is some re resolution over time, but there's there with PGD, a lot of people are not getting better with time alone is the basic point I'd like to, to make. So we've developed what we call a microsociological theory of adjustment to loss. And, um, you know, uh, my husband likes to quote Aristotle, uh, at, who says that nature abhors a vacuum. So we applied that whole notion uh, to, to bereavement and social space. So the phrase expresses the idea that unfilled spaces uh, go against the laws of nature and physics and that every space needs to be filled with something. Does the same hold true for the social space created by an interpersonal loss? So we've proposed this theory, uh, we call it a microsociological theory that focuses on the social implications of loss. So what we say is that when someone very, very close to you, uh, uh, a significant other dies, it creates all these social deprivations, a sense of lacking, a sense of belonging and connectedness, uh, uh, actually not being a burden on others. One, one thing we found is actually caring and nurturing of others is therapeutic for the person providing that care. So that's no longer can a caregiver provide it because the person is no longer there. The feeling of safety and security that others provide to, to a person, the sense of identity, role clarification, feeling understood, loved, appreciated, uh, appreciating, valuing, and loving others, that all those social interactions and part of that social space, once the significant other is gone, uh, is, is a void and needs to be filled. And so we, we believe that targeting interventions, interventions that target those particular social or psychosocial deprivations will help reduce the symptoms of, of prolonged grief and suicidal ideation post-loss. And we have some data that support some of this. Most recently, I've add, I wanted to add a bullet to this list of social deprivations because um, I'll, I'll mention very briefly our simpatico uh, intervention. One of the deprivations also that might go on, have gone unnoticed is the feeling of familiarity, the old shoe uh, issue, the comf that especially for later life widowhood, the, uh, there are all these uh, situations in life that you you are moving through. You would wake up at the same time with this person. Your usual habits and routine was pretty ingrained, and it just got to feel very natural, familiar, and comfortable, like an old shoe. Now that person's gone, and every interaction you're having is now a new a new relationship a new way of doing things not the same old way that you were used to and grown accustomed to so that's another challenge especially for an older person who might be a little more set in their ways how to adjust the 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 deprivation of the comfort of familiarity so uh put in pin in that and and we'll get to that uh hopefully in mentioning some of these adaptations that uh, apply this theory of this micro sociological theory of adaptation to loss. So we recently were funded uh, to test uh, basically a me machine learning model to detect suicidality because a lot of people who were coming to our center website uh, and engaging with our living memory home that has a journal where we have question prompts uh, that elicit a lot of uh, thoughts and and condolence notes and letters to the deceased and uh, a lot of evocative uh, prompts that people journal. We wanted to use that to detect the language that would pose a risk for suicidality. Uh, initially, the concern was that people who were coming to our website were disproportionately people with PGD, which are at heightened risk for suicidal 
thoughts and behaviors, as I've shown, but also a disproportionate number were suicide bereaved and accidental overdose bereaved. So we wanted to make sure that the people that were writing things in the journal weren't saying things that would be highly correlated, for example, with the Columbia suicide screen. So, so we are uh, just about done with the with this study where we recruited 100 people to engage with our online uh, living memory home where the, the, the key aspect of it, we, there are there is like this treasure chest and a memorial windowsill that there is decorated with pictures and, and songs can be uploaded. Um, but the, the, the meat of it was really the text uh, and the language of suicide that we were trying to detect in these uh, bereaved people who were using the memory home. One of the things that we found is that simply journaling, as I think I was mentioning to Joe before we started, was we just wanted to make sure that this was a safe place for people and that it wasn't uh, opening a lot of wounds that were triggering suicidal thoughts or, or, or worsening their grief symptoms. And what we found is a, a simple exercise of logging in and uh, journaling about their lost loved one for uh, every day for uh, seven days was associated with a significant de decline in their PG-13 scores. So we're, we've also been using some uh, qualitative analysis to code some of the text and are finding uh, interesting things about burdensomeness and belongingness that might relate so to fill some of those psychosocial voids that we think uh, are also we found uh, in in a very small subset highly correlated with the grief score and in, uh, inverse and and positively associated with a higher uh, suicide score it looks like we're about to be funded for a study that adapts the living memory home for dementia care pairs where the dementia caregiver in a home based setting uh, is feeling symptoms of pre-loss grief, missing missing the person that this person used to be, not having uh, activities that are positive, that um, communicate appreciation and respect for the uh, patient with dementia. And so we, we are reconfiguring this online living memory home to adapt it to be sort of a, a game uh, with, with the caregiver and a patient with early stage dementia to record some of these memories before it's too late and before their memory makes that uh, impossible uh, to reduce regrets later on, but also to enhance the quality of their relationship and reduce their pre-loss grief uh, uh, before the patient, before it's too late for the uh, patient with dementia. So I'll let that, that's our living memory home uh, 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 those are two uh, R21s that were funded, uh, one's about to be funded. And then the, the theoretical model is that the living memory home would target some of those social deprivations, that that would reduce pre-loss grief and improve the caregiver relationship, and that that would reduce uh, future bereavement outcomes uh, down, down the road. We also are developing a, a bunch of online suites we call Finding My Way. Uh, through grief. And it, the suite would include uh, the living memory home journaling feature. We also have uh, cognitive reframing exercises where we we've, we've published a scale that has bereavement challenges and um, something, things that, that a, a, like a recent widow would say is that um, no one will understand me or love me or know me like the person who died. And so we we have all these cognitions that uh, we, we evaluate their bereavement challenges and then we sort them into different domains. And then we have literally an old frame and a new frame online where we have them reframe some of those negative cognitions with five offerings of different ways of thinking about those things. Like maybe they won't love you exactly the same way, but in a different way, they'll find, you know, the, the, it'll be a different relationship that's rewarding in different ways. So we, we try to reframe some of the negative bereavement cognitions, particularly about others. We also have a social mapping feature that helps people diagram who does what for them in their social network. So who's a good listener and who's not so good a listener, who's 
fun, but not such a good listener, who's who's not so fun and not a good listener, but they have a car and you need them to get your groceries or, or go to the pharmacy or whatever. So we have them map out who's in their social network and, um, and who does what so that if they have a need, they, they can be thinking about who to approach. We also have some social skills training that might be rusty, especially in later life uh, for older widowers to help them rehearse what, you know, conversation starters and how to talk to somebody that they might not know already and how to make conversation. And finally, we're developing and testing our simpatico uh, feature. So simpatico refers to this notion in bereavement that people who, bereaved people and bereaved support groups have been shown to only be as effective as the connection to the other people in that group. So for example, a mother of drunk drivers who lost their child to a drunk driver isn't going to feel that supported or identify with or share so much uh, with uh, someone who's, a, who's lost a father to dementia. So we, we're developing the simpatico algorithm to compare connections to like loss and like kinship relationship to others. So those are the simpatico features. And our hypothesis is that the more simpatico, the, the match, the online match, uh, and we ask them to connect with this person uh, like two to three times a week to just make conversation and engage with them, that the lower their grief scores and suicidal uh, beliefs and behaviors, uh, if, if the match is, is a better match, a more simpatico match. Ultimately, we want to enhance that to include like interests and make it sort of uh, a paired with like meetup activities so that they, one of their friends might hear that there's a ball game that the, you know, the Yankees are in town and do you, making it really easy for them to actually do behaviorally meet up with, with people in, with whom they feel simpatico. Uh, Dr. Ferguson, I'm, yes. I'm wondering if I may interrupt for, for a moment to pose a couple of questions that have come in. We've got yes. about seven minutes. Um, very, very, uh, Interesting, and especially considering this sociological uh, intervention here, or one that's based on uh, uh, relationships, social interactions. Uh, some questions came in about um, experiences earlier in life, um, grief-related experiences, perhaps not bereavement, but maybe so. Uh, uh, early childhood loss uh, of, of a parent, perhaps, or a family member. Uh, consequences of racism, uh, for example, incarceration, uh, or grief experiences that aren't necessarily bereavement, do they seem to have an impact? What effect have you seen? Do you, can you see PGD in these circumstances and, and so on? Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, I think I'm not gonna be able to, to finish up and get to all this, but okay. one, <laughs> one example, let me, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, one example, is that uh, two weeks ago, a nurse from Seattle actually emailed me to have a research idea. And she said, uh, she was a, a, a Latina woman, mother who was obese. And um, she was estranged from uh, her adult children. And uh, she was wondering whether it, that was grief or not. And uh, she said that she was weeping every, especially around the holidays, that not having that connection with her adult children and this is adult, a stranger from your adult children, could that precipitate prolonged grief disorder? And, and I'm just using that as, as a proxy for other types of anything. So grief in a nutshell, we've defined as like wanting what you can have. Bereavement, I think the word comes from the, uh, being robbed of something. So grief, grief is that yearning and pining and longing for something that you crave, but you are denied. And so you you just are, are beside yourself, frustrated, helpless, angry, that you can't reconnect with this thing that you think you need to make you feel ha happy or at least whole and well-functioning. And so the reason why I'm mentioning her is not only was that a, I think a, a an apt uh, 
non-death type of loss. So it could be loss of a feeling of, of uh, maybe a feeling of justice or a, living in a just world or safety. One of my research assistants wants to do a study of environmental grief and feeling like the planet's uh, you know, mourning and uh, over the her love of nature and that uh, life will never be the same and she won't be able to enjoy the things or her children won't be able to enjoy the environment. So I, I do think that you know, we, as a first case, we wanted to go with uh, death of a of a significant other to be conservative and then generalize. But I would think anything that reaches the bar where th that thing it could be a cherished ideal. It could be like wanting to be a physician and not you uh, not making it to into medical school or whatever that thing is. A cherished ideal is being taken is is gone and denied. Um, you're going to feel grief in in reaction to that. The reason why I'm mentioning this nurse is she said that she was obese and that she was prescribed something. It was a combination. Uh, of Wellbutrin and naltrexone, and she said she not. I I don't know if it this was the Wellbutrin or the naltrexone, but we've had six cases. I gave a talk in Brazil a month ago where a psychiatrist told me that nothing else that worked for grief, naltrexone worked for three of her cases. When I was up at Harvard, three of those cases worked as well when nothing else had worked for them. She said that after she took, not only did she lose twenty pounds. Uh, but within two months, she no longer was weeping and just missing that 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 aching in her heart. Heart, I guess it's it's a sense you could say just heartache. That naltrexone helped reduce the heartache from the re missing the reward of of being united with that thing. In her case, it was her living adult adult children. So. We are actively recruiting for a naltrexone trial as a proof of concept to see whether in an RCT compared to placebo, whether naltrexone might, uh, we, we've also, sh we also want to test that it, it won't uh, affect relationships that aren't so special. That, so the, the idea is that uh, this freeing someone from the throes of being, of l intense yearning and pining for something that they can't have opens them up potentially to other social uh, engagements and to finding meaning with other people who are living. So that's that's our our that's our conceptual model of why we think naltrexone will work, but also uh, it focuses on the the social the social aspects of uh, readjustment to life in the wake of the loss of a significant other that I think psychiatry and uh, admittedly our me and my research program has focused a lot on the psychological symptoms and reactions and treatments when a lot of the the issues are social so i i think i'll stop there i i don't think i'll be able to talk about our empower intervention that's proven extremely effective for symptoms of pre-loss grief and uh and i was going to briefly discuss the naltrexone trial, but I think I'll stop sharing uh, now. Dr. Perkinson, could you, could you comment just on the Empower? You, uh, you, I think you used the phrase pre-loss grief. When is that intervention delivered? Oh, so, uh, oh, no, no, let me. Uh, <laughs> is it, is it uh, a time of di diagnosis of a? Yeah, of a so yeah. our Empower, our Empower intervention, so we, we were recently funded by an R1, multi-site R01 to, uh, confirm in a multi-site study. Now it's at, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, Penn, and um, in Miami, as well as New York Presby. We get people in the ICU. It was created, um, it was in response to the directors of the MICU saying the family surrogates of patients who are dying are being handed to sign a do not resuscitate order. And we think that the family members are not in a psychological place ready to be signing anything and be they, they they need they need some support. So empower uh, uh, provides some mindfulness meditation. It it provides some psychoeducation. It provides a role play about what this patient who can't communicate in the ICU uh, what would they say and want if they could speak with you to reduce decisional regret post loss, and and we're we're finding that uh, these pretty 
pretty standard CBT act and some meaning centered grief therapy pre loss uh, prevent significantly lowers their pre loss and post loss grief if the pa if the patient actually does die, which happened in about half of the the cases. Um, and it significantly re reduced their uh, PTSD scores at one in three months uh, post-loss very significantly. It actually uh, decreased their experiential avoidance most significantly at the, t at the three month post-loss, which was counter to our hypothetical model, which was that experiential avoid, you had to target experiential avoidance to enhance uh, tolerance of uncertainty and distress tolerance to enable them to hear what was actually happening to the patient and then work with that. For some reason, it seems that once their grief and, and psychological trauma is addressed, that that seems to lower their experiential avoidance later on rather than vice versa. So we're still trying to understand that better, but that's when and how it's supposed to work. Thank you for sum summarizing that. I realized that was part of what was remaining in, in your presentation. Uh, I, I think I'm, I'm already over. You're right. You're right. Uh, well, look, Dr. Ferguson, thank you very much for, for presenting today in the Grand Round series. Uh, I appreciate you going through really the history of this, the how you identified this early on in, in a, a depression treatment trial and, and, and went from there. And the, the justification for this disorder and 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 uh, what you're doing now. It's very informative, and I think there are uh, you know remaining questions that people have asked. We're, we're, we are though at at the time, and and we'll, yeah, we'll, I, we'll... I I know I I feel like I I said that I wanted to be interrupted, <laughs> and if the chats were intended to interrupt me, it's I I, 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 I think I, you were I, going, I and I, it's 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 okay. I think you know you were presenting, and I yeah. Uh, so thank you again, um, and we could we'll we'll end there for today. And I, again, I appreciate it uh, that you presented today very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Pleasure. Bye.